39-year-old Charles Morgan led a normal and, some might even say, boring life. He worked as the president of his own escrow agency at Statewide Escrow in Tucson, Arizona. He lived a seemingly content life with his wife and four daughters. Then, on March 22, 1977, he drove two of his daughters to school, he vanished off of the face of the earth. And so would begin the mystery of an unsolved death surrounded by a myriad of weird clues. Pick related, Charles Morgan. When Charles didn't return by evening, his wife Ruth became very worried and she reported him missing. For the next three days there was no sign of Charles, and then something very strange happened. At two in the morning, three days after her husband had disappeared, Ruth was woken up by a banging at the back door. When she went to see who it was, she was surprised to see Charles standing there, apparently in a daze. He had one shoe missing, and had a plastic handcuff around one ankle and another set around his hands. When she tried to talk to him, he gestured towards his throat in a panic, so she sat her husband down with a pen and a pad and the story would get even weirder. Charles scrawled out on the paper that he had been kidnapped and tortured, and that his throat had been sprayed with a mysterious hallucinogenic drug that affected the nervous system. If he were to try and talk he risked swallowing it and going irrevocably insane or dying. The only way to keep this from happening was to not speak. His frantic wife begged him to go to a hospital but he flat out refused, saying that they would kill him and the whole family if he did. Sorry, forgot to mention that this one is long, but it's worth it Imo. He told Ruth to move his car to the back so that these sinister mysterious assailants wouldn't know he had come home. Ruth did as she was told, and for the next few days she took care of Charles, nursing him back to health. During this time the only thing he would say was that he had worked for them for around three years and that they had taken away his treasury identification. He implied that he was working for the federal government as an agent combating organized crime, although details were murky. When Ruth asked for more information, he told her that the less she knew, the better, and that was that. Charles slowly regained his ability to speak, but he refused to talk to his family about what had happened. At the same time, he became very paranoid, constantly checking outside and growing a thicker beard in order to change his appearance. He took to wearing a bulletproof vest at all times. After some time had passed, he confided in his wife that he was working as an agent for the United States Treasury Department, and that it involved real estate fraud and money laundering being carried out by the Mafia, something he had deep knowledge of working in escrow. And in this case he was testifying against two major mafia groups, the ominous Ned Warren family and the Joe Bonanno family. He told her that if anything were to happen to him, he would leave a letter behind explaining everything. Shortly after this, Charles Morgan vanished again after dropping his daughters off at school, and this time he would not be coming back. Ruth and the police looked for the letter he had promised, but it never did turn up and as the investigation seemed to be going cold Ruth received a mysterious phone call from an unidentified woman who called herself Green Eyes, and simply said, Chuck is all right. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8, before hanging up. Two days later, on June 18, 1977, Chuck would be found again, but this time he was a corpse, shot dead along a remote dirt road about 40 miles away from his home. When police arrived at the scene, they found that he had died from a gunshot to the back of his head. He was wearing his bulletproof vest, and he was also armed with a handgun and hunting knife, as well as various other firearms with ample ammunition in his car. Considering the handgun he had been carrying had been fired, it seemed as if he must have committed suicide, but there were anomalies. First, the gunpowder marks from the shot were found on his left hand even though he had been right-handed. Then, the gun itself had been wiped clean of fingerprints. In fact the whole car had been totally wiped, despite Morgan not wearing gloves. How would he be able to wipe clean the weapon and scene after shooting himself in the head, and why would he shoot himself in the back of the head, anyway? Also found in the back seat was one of Morgan's teeth wrapped in a white handkerchief, as well as a pair of sunglasses that did not belong to him in the front passenger seat. Other strange clues were a map that he had drawn by hand, 
which led to the spot where he had died, and a $2 bill clipped to the inside of his underwear. On this bill were found a, some references to Freemasonry, b, seven Spanish names, Acevedo, Bejarano, Cairo, Duarte, Encinas, Fuente, and Gratillas, and c, the words Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verses 1 through 8. The bill also had written on the back the names of the signers of the Declaration of Independence numbered 1 through 7 and a map leading to the towns of Robles Junction and Sala City. What did any of this mean? No one knew. Unbelievably, despite all of this, police were eager to embrace the suicide explanation and sweep it all away. Pick related, the bill found on Charles Morgan's body. Not long after the body was found, the woman calling herself Green Eyes made another call, this time directly to police. She claimed that shortly before the death she had met with Charles at a local motel. He had shown her a briefcase stuffed with money, and claimed that it was to buy out a hit that had been put out on him by the mob. According to her, Charles had driven out into that desert with the money to meet with the hitman and buy him off, but instead the hitman had killed him and taken the money. Then, Ruth would have her own odd experience. Two men claiming to be FBI agents came to her house and tore it apart looking for something they don't seem to have been able to find. In the face of all of this, authorities deemed the death a suicide, stating that there was no hard evidence that the mysterious woman's story was true and no evidence of foul play. The case was picked up by investigative journalist Don Devereux, who says that he says that he uncovered evidence that Morgan had indeed testified in a secret state investigation against the Mafia, but when he contacted the FBI for more information, they claimed they did not even know who Morgan was. Devereux would say of this, I made a Freedom of Information Act request to the FBI, and they claimed never to have heard of Mr. Morgan, despite the fact that they obviously opened an investigation, and despite the fact the FBI interviewed Mr. Morgan's attorney. They were all over this thing like a blanket for a while. But now they've never heard of the guy. He never existed. No card, no file, no nothing. Devereux's investigation would also lead him to a man named Danny Casolero who agreed to share secret information on what Morgan had been up to. But before this meeting took place, Casolero was found dead in a motel room from 12 slashes to the wrist. The police said it was a suicide. Someone also didn't seem to like the reporter snooping around. A man named Doug Johnston, who happened to work right across the street from Devereux, was found shot dead in his car, which just happened to be the same make and model as Devereux's, leading the reporter to suspect that he himself had been the actual target. Here are some of Devereux's thoughts on the case. I've never seen, in all my years as a journalist, a fellow take himself out in the desert wearing a bulletproof vest and shoot himself in the back of the head. There is a great likelihood that Mr. Morgan was, in fact, doing something with the government. I think somebody blew his cover and he got killed. He was around the edges of a couple of very large organized crime groups in Arizona at that time. It was very easy to get in over your head, and I suspect that over the years, Mr. Morgan was in that kind of situation. He was a straight businessman that probably got a little a too close to the flame. I think the $2 bill provided the basis for some kind of a code. What seemed to be missing, however, was the document that the $2 bill would unlock. If he was quietly providing assistance to the US government and monitoring the activities of one or more major organized crime families, then he wasn't a villain. He was a good guy. And they need to know that. What happened to Charles Morgan? What is the meaning of all of the clues surrounding his death? Who was Green Eyes and what part did she have to play? Was Morgan killed by sinister forces, and if so, why? Why did the FBI deny any knowledge of this case, and was someone out to get the one who was investigating it all? What was the meaning of the note on that $2 bill? It is a bafflingly strange case, permeated by dark conspiracies and cover UPS and we may never know for sure. In the meantime, it is officially listed as a suicide. Timeline of the Disappearance of Matthew Weaver Jr. August 10, 2018 5 a.m. Matthew Weaver Jr., 21 years old, drops off a female friend at her home in Chatsworth. 
They had been hanging out that night, and according to the girl, she had to get to work. Matthew then heads toward Stunt and Shu Aaron R.D., in Malibu. 624 to 657 AM picture posted on Matthew's Snapchat from the Stunt R.D. and Saddle Peak R.D. parking lot. 715 AM security camera captures Matthew's vehicle entering the white gate to Topanaga Tower motorway, suspiciously left open. It normally remains locked and should only be accessible by first responders and law enforcement officials. 7.28 a.m. Matthew's vehicle reaches the end of the trail at the area of Rose's Overlook. From here forward the trail is no wider than a footpath. 11.49 a.m. Matthew attempts to call the same female friend, and then sends his last text message to her indicating crazy, shit, is going on. He does not call or text anyone else again. August 11, 2018 12 a.m. An individual in the area of Rose's Overlook hears a cry for help and calls 911. A female and male voice were heard screaming for help by witnesses, specifically saying somebody has a gun. 1 a.m. Subsequent response from CHP and LA County Fire Department locates Matthew's vehicle. It is two miles down the trail at the edge of Rose's Overlook. The front bumper is missing and the car is locked. The trunk lock is damaged from the inside. At least two members of the CHP and of the fire department also heard scream slash cry for help. 2 AM Lost Hills Sheriff Department and Search and Rescue responded to the scene with multiple air and canine support as well as infrared technology, but were unable to locate anyone. Matthew Weaver Jr. cell phone, wallet, car keys, and clothing have not been found. It started on August 20th. 1990. Police were raiding a small warehouse in New York City under the suspicion of drug trafficking centered upon that building. No evidence was found in the warehouse except for a floppy disk labeled, We Cannot Stop It. Officer Charles F. was assigned with the task of reviewing the contents of the floppy disk. Four days later he and the floppy disk disappeared. Charles is never seen again. The investigation is closed due to there being no more sufficient evidence after the loss of the floppy disk. On February 28, 1994, Harriet G. of Alabama receives a letter with no return address or stamp. It contains another floppy disk, this one labeled, History Repeats Itself, and a loose leaf sheet of paper with, you know the rules written on it. Harriet inserts the floppy disk onto her computer the same day. Reports from her friends and family indicate that she acted very paranoid and irritable and repeatedly murmured about something called the shift until March 12, 1994 when she hanged herself. Both the lost, we cannot stop it, and, history repeats itself, discs were found on her corpse. Police confiscated both, and several days later they were stolen. No culprit for the theft was ever found. From February 4, 1998 to February 8, 1998, Lawrence G. of Illinois receives numerous phone calls from several numbers with unregistered area codes asking to meet us at location omitted. Lawrence finally complies, but finds no one else there, only a small black briefcase with the number 4444 printed on it. When he returns home he finds the briefcase contains a note saying, the shift is coming down, and yet another floppy disk labeled Shift 4. Lawrence went into a coma four days after uploading the disk to his computer and was pronounced dead as of July 4, 2002. The Shift 4 disk has since disappeared, but, we cannot stop it, and, history repeats itself, are rumored to still be around. In spite of this, no one has ever claimed to know the contents of any of the three floppy disks. This is all of what I've uncovered in my ceaseless research of the little-known paranormal phenomenon called the Shift. My interest was piqued when a friend of mine was repeatedly receiving calls from a number that had an unregistered area code. According to him, each call would begin with an upbeat dial tone jingle and then what sounded like a female operator would say a string of numbers and then the phrase we have prepared the way for you. Interested, I started to search up on strange phone calls like these. I came across the shift which was basically pieced together over a scattered series of obscure websites and blogs containing small bits of info about it. I collected enough information over several days to formulate the snippets above. This unnerved me slightly, 
but nevertheless he and I had thought it was a prank until he received his last call from that unregistered number on March 25th, 2010, which began with the normal dial tone jingle and then the numbers. And finally the voice said at such a high volume that even I could hear it from the other room the shift is coming down. Right after she hung up, his doorbell rang. When we opened the door, there was no one there. Only a small, black briefcase with 55,555 printed on it. It contained a note say, return where we began in a disc labeled, shift 5. Having knowledge of the fates of the previous owners of these discs concerning the shift, I warned him not to put it on his computer, but despite my earnest begging he refused to listen. Thus, I refused to be in the same room as him while he viewed the contents of the disc. Five minutes later HE walks out of the room, eyes widened and skin as white as a ghost, and falls to the floor, having a massive seizure. He was admitted to the hospital, and just died today. I managed to get my hands on the disc. I have reviewed it just minutes ago and have suffered no life-threatening affects. Though I'd rather not post the images it contained. They were very, very mindfuck worthy. I can't really describe them, but if I posted them I can guarantee it would not sit well with many, many people. Anyways, that's my story, and I'm hope some other people might know something about the shift so maybe you guys can help me figure this thing oh you 555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555555
but he refused to do it. To make matters worse, he began collecting evidence about what he had seen and evidence of the cover-up he was witnessing, such as how the FBI was relying on witness testimony from officers who were not present on the scene. Yaki was set to be honored with a Medal of Valor for his actions on the day of the bombing, but a day before the award ceremony, he mysteriously committed suicide. The last time Yaki was heard from, he was on the phone with his ex-wife telling her that federal agents were pursuing him and he was trying to escape. When his body was found, it revealed that he had committed suicide in a strange fashion, he was said to have slit his wrists and neck, causing him to nearly bleed to death in his car, and then miraculously climbed over a barbed wire fence. He then was purported to have walked over a mile's distance, through a nearby field, eventually shooting himself in the side of the head. No weapons were found at the scene. Has anyone ever been visited by the feds for going on this site? Or are the stories of crap like that happening mostly just paranoid anons? Look in your driveway. For going on this site. Not for visiting 4chan, but I wrote a mean email to George W. Bush when he was running for re-election in 2004 and was visited by a few Secret Service agents. By mean I mean overtly threatening. I was specific to, mentioning the Bush family and everything. No I'm not an internet keyboard terrorist, let me provide some context. B14. Saw a campaign email pulled up on my friend's parents' computer. Decided it would be funny to reply saying all kinds of crazy stuff. Sent it, think nothing of it. A month or so later get a call from my friend's mom saying the secret service is there asking about the email. Damn. Tell my dad. He says I'm stupid and I need to own up to it when they get there so they will see I'm just a kid screwing around. They come to my house. Three black cars, black windows. Two of them get out of only one car. They had backup. They come in and start talking to me. Asking me questions that were purposed to asses my mental state. Have you thought of harming others or yourself? Do you see hallucinations? That kind of stuff. They are apparently convinced I was indeed some stupid kid messing around and wasting their time. They shame me for doing so stupid, and I felt shamed. They tell me I will be on a list and I will never be approved for a security clearance and if I were to go into the military there is a maximum rank I can achieve. They leave. I later went to his inauguration, I had been to the first one too, in a school trip and my group was denied entry. I secretly knew why but I didn't tell any of them because I was embarrassed. One kid was bawling his eyes out because he didn't get to see his hero, George W. Bush. Sorry man. To the agents reading this, I'm definitely a good boy now. You already know that though. Twelve years ago I was warned by staff in the Oz Federal Attorney General's office that a forum I was on was under surveillance by a political team within their department. Never was raided or anything, but I am squeaky clean apart from shit posting on here. A guy I know who was pulled off an international flight by the feds, imported laser pointers, ordered before the ban, they arrived after, subsequently had his house entered twice, but nothing taken, persistent Wi-Fi network ASIO van near his house. Called in for interview twice, IIRC. Basically he's a big mouth and a repeat minor party senate candidate, so he's on their list. A guy I know in the USA was one of the first elite hackers and a militia member. Twenty years later he's a father of six, including adopting a couple, the largest landlord in his town, runs a secure cloud designed to survive a nuclear strike and does penetration tests on Fortune 500 companies. He funds the local school and is friends with the sheriff. The state police haul him out of the car and prone him at gunpoint whenever he is pulled over and when Obama was in the nearest city there was a black suburban parked outside his house. Once you are listed as armed and dangerous you never get off it. The forum we chat on is private, it was used for strategy of the Heller case among other things. The admin effectively told us he had received a national security letter requiring him to turn over data when he heavily suggested we go to tour and consider everything we ever said as on there as being public. So yes, surveillance is real. 
but they keep it low-key until you start spouting off in public and mention guns. Not exactly, but they did figure it out. Be me. Be early 2016. Had a restraining order on me cause of a misdemeanor battery charge, I got into a fight with my ex's new boyfriend. Didn't get rid of my rifle that I built from 80% receiver. X tips off the courts that I have rifle. Six Department of Justice special agents at my house. They take me into custody and ask me where the rifle is. Tell them cause I don't want them to toss the house. So Anon, where did you learn to build a rifle from an 80%? Begin to say the internet when he guesses. K slash on 4chan? Uh, yeah I say bewildered a 40 something fed knew exactly where I learned how. Super freaked out thinking all of those fed memes were real. Nothing ever came of it though. They didn't bring it up again or in court. Get charges dropped from prohibited person's possession of a firearm felony to misdemeanor probation violation due to length of time between restraining order and arrest. Cleaned up trash on the side of freeway for 14 days. Years ago I was involved with various anti-globalist groups, before they became anti-white kooks, and with the ecologist movement. There was a bunch of demonstrations over a short period of time. When I was attending one, I used to be the guy in charge of taking photos to make us look like glorious heroes of the revolution. The first times everything went well, we were only dealing with regular cops who were making sure that the demonstrations would not turn into chip outs, but eventually as more and more people got involved some strange black cars started to show up. Once I was followed by one of them in a street as I was walking back to my car. It was slowly driving by my side with fully dark tinted windows. I was under the impression that they were simply curious because I had a suspicious backpack, that was filled with photography gear. It turned out that after that day, every time I would show up at a demonstration there would be some grayman in regular civilians cars taking pictures of me. Anyways, eventually the whole movement died down and I never saw these people again. It might sound a bit anticlimactic, but I suppose that they have some sort of dossier about me somewhere. So yeah, keep in mind that as soon as you start to get involved into something politically incorrect, they will document who you are, just in case. IIRC Edward Snowden revealed that NSA collects data about the fetishes and porn viewing habits of suspected radicals so they can be used as blackmail material later. You think they only blackmail radicals? I bet they've got files on everyone. Some kid today will be blackmailed in 20 years by the deep state feds when he's elected into public office because he spanked it to fake incest porn one time when he was 14. You think you live in a democracy, but under the surface is leverage. And leverage is where the real power lies. I set up, up a website probably around 6 or so years ago. It was pro Julian Assange and anti-intelligence agencies. I wrote a few pieces on the matter. I was definitely being followed. One day at work I had a guy come in and just stare at me constantly with a slight smirk for about 10 minutes. He was probably mid 40s, bald with a long beard, a bit of a pot belly, and covered in tats. I eventually went over to him and asked him if he needed help. He replied no, and I go to walk away then he asked me who I was. I asked him why, and he said he already knew who I was. That was unnerving then after a few seconds of silence, he asked me what else I did. I said I studied, and he said he knew. Then he just smiled and walked away. After leaving work, regardless of time, there was always an unmarked black hole in there which subsequently followed me home. This happened for about two weeks. Occasionally I'd quickly try to take an unexpected turn to try and evade it and they'd just turn around and follow me. One time I did evade them but they ended up driving past my house as I parked the car. They would always made sure to drive past my house. It was either me writing about Assange or the fact that I was hanging out with a couple of weed dealers around that time. The most true statement here. There is a digital file somewhere with everything about you. And it contains more about you than you know about yourself. They have every cell phone number, text, email, 
all your friends, their friends, family ECT ECT. Your likes dislikes, profiles on behavior past and predictive. Every place you go. Travel times and modes of travel. How long you were there and how often you go. Who else was in that location prior and after. Browsing habits. Sexual preference. Political affiliations. Any activist groups you may be part of bad habits. Do you lie cheat steal your weaknesses and desires? A list of things that could grant leverage over you. The only question is who has access to it and can use it. Today and in the days to come. It is quite the beast. The Yagan people of Tierra del Fuego knew of the South Orkney Islands and the South Shetland Islands which they shunned, and also of the inhabitants of those islands about whom they told dark and hateful stories. European explorer William Smith found the natives barbaric in ways that he had never before encountered, inbred cannibals who wore bone armor and revered a goddess of death and fire. Ruined stone obelisks in the islands and on the Antarctic Peninsula as well as the occasional metal artifact indicated that the natives had once been more numerous and more advanced, but little was learned about them as diseases spread by European contact promptly wiped the island tribes out. An 1821 Russian expedition perished to a mysterious disease, the American explorer Jeremy Robinson claimed to have discovered new sources of wealth power and happiness in Antarctica but he vanished without a trace. Other explorers disappeared or met mysterious ends although this only piqued the curiosity of their fellows. The Frenchman Dumont d'Urville discovered an odd lichen in West Antarctica which proved not to be a lichen at all, but rather something entirely new whose cells contained wholly foreign structures and made use of silicon instead of carbon in their biology. Robert Scott and Roald Amundsen reported additional obelisks poking through the ice, far from the islands where the natives had lived and raised questions about how they might have come to be. The dry valleys that they found were lifeless, arid places largely free of ice where it never snowed nor rained. Constant 200 miles per hour winds tore down the valleys, carving their rocky walls into fantastic shapes. The ground had been scaled into geometric patterns eons passed by the movement of dead glaciers, and what soil existed was thin and parched. The explorers found the mummified corpses of seals and seabirds, and of a man clad in bone armor perfectly preserved by the conditions. There was water in the valleys, in the form of rivers, lakes, and ponds. The first encountered by the explorers was the unnaturally round goddess Osh, God's Eye, lake located in a crater some distance inland. During the winter the surface of Goddess Och froze, but during the summer the edges of the lake melted creating a ring of liquid water around a circle of perpetually frozen ice. From the hills approaching it in the summer the lake gave the impression of nothing so much as a huge eye gazing at the heavens. Terminating there was the Schwarzstrom the Black River for which the southernmost valley was named. The thick presence of mineral salts in the river rendered it black and undrinkable, and also lowered its freezing point so that it remained liquid all year round. The source of the Schwarzstrom was the bloody falls at the glacial end of the valley where the waters ran red as blood. The latter was named for the subterranean Alf River which began above ground at Lake Coetlitz and ran beneath moraine and glacier for most of its length before reaching the sea. The former valley was much stranger, it and the smaller valley beyond it emitted a pale blue glow at night. In the other valleys they found fossils, fossilized leaves and the bones of giant reptilian creatures indicating that against all common sense there had been a time when Antarctica was tropical before some antediluvian catastrophe reduced it all to ice. There were the bones of men, turned to stone by the millennia, and the tip of a worn and rounded obelisk poking from the glacier beyond the bloody falls. In the crossroads valley a two-centimeter crust of green, black, and red glass, circular and miles in diameter, covered odd mineral deposits of iron, copper, pure aluminum, and other metals. There was further glass in the blue valley, as well as burnt shadows on the rocks. Here there were native ruins, melted metal monuments about which were clustered huts of unmortared stone and signs that once the natives had worshipped their goddess here. The Russo-German explorers learned quickly to avoid parts of the Blue Valley outside the ruins and particularly the valley beyond it, for otherwise the unwary risked dying a slow and unpleasant death as their hair fell out, they vomited blood, and they went into seizures. 
Explorers found that the algae which bloomed in the lakes could be rendered edible and the water drinkable by the use of evaporation stills, and stumbled onto a small petrol reservoir not far from Gatasach. Straight up bullcrap, straight out the ass. Lore from Yagan people. I don't dismiss that it could be all bullcrap, but it's the stories they tell. Can we have the source? It's a reference to the legend of the iceberg of Kanasaka. They come from the White Island of the South. It's a traditional Selknam legend that claims that they come from the White Island of the South. The legend talks about a Yagan that was trapped in an iceberg and floated from the island of origin to the continent. The Yagan were traditionally nomads, who were hunter-gatherers. They traveled by canoes between islands to collect food. Due to their home on these southern islands, they are often referred to as the southernmost people in the world. They lived and lived in dome-shaped buildings heated by fire and prior to European colonization they wore no clothing, and often slept outside despite the bitter cold of their environment. When Europeans first encountered the Yagan people they were amazed how these indigenous peoples of the southern cone could adapt to the cold. Although it rained all the time, and temperatures were often in the 30s and 40s, the Yagan people seemed completely comfortable with virtually no clothes, and often slept in the open and swam in the ocean. Supposedly, the Yagan possess a body temperature a full degree higher than other people. This seems plausible given their seemingly superhuman resistance to cold, but the source of the claim is unknown, and it may be impossible to verify, for there is only a single pure-blooded Yagan left alive today, Abuela Cristina Calderon who lives in Chilean territory. She is the last native speaker of the Yagan language. Someone please post the story about the alien race who launch a nuke at Earth, then regret it. The one that ends with we are coming for you. That's possibly the best pasta I've read on slash tg slash. I saved it, good stuff. I'm Sage Begins. We made a mistake. That is the simple, undeniable truth of the matter, however painful it might be. The flaw was not in our observatories, for those machines were as perfect as we could make, and they showed us only the unfiltered light of truth. The flaw was not in the predictor, for it is a device of pure, infallible logic, turning raw data into meaningful information without the taint of emotion or bias. No, the flaw was within us, the orchestrators of this disaster, the sentients who thought themselves beyond such failings. We are responsible. It began a short while ago, as these things are measured, less than 66 daily ago, though I suspect our systems of measure will mean very little by the time anyone receives this transmission. We detected faint radio signals from a blossoming intelligence 214 delis outward from the galactic core, as photons travel. At first crude and unstructured, these leaking broadcasts quickly grew in complexity and strength, as did the messages they carried. Through our observatories we watched a world of strife and violence, populated by a barbaric race of short-lived, fast-breeding vermin. They were brutal and uncultured things which stabbed and shot and burned each other with no regard for life or purpose. Even their concepts of art spoke of conflict and pain. They divided themselves according to some bizarre cultural patterns and set their every industry to cause of death. They terrified us, but we were older and wiser and so very far away, so we did not fret. Then we watched them split the atom and breach the heavens within the breadth of one of their single, short generations, and we began to worry. When they began actively transmitting messages and greetings into space, we felt fear and horror. Their transmissions promised peace and camaraderie to any who were listening, but we had watched them for too long to buy into such transparent deceptions. They knew we were out here, and they were coming for us. The orchestrators consulted the predictor, and the output was dire. They would multiply and grow and flood out of their home system like some uncountable tide of devourer worms, consuming all that lay in their path. It might take six to eight delis, but they would destroy us if left unchecked. With aching carapaces we decided to act, and sealed our fate. The gift of mercy was eight to the power of fourth strides long with a mouth two fourths that in diameter, filled with many four to the power of fourth weights of machinery, fuel, and ballast. It would push itself up to two eighths of light speed with its onboard fuel, and then begin to consume interstellar primary element two halves to feed its unlimited acceleration. It would be traveling at nearly light speed when it hit. They would never see it coming. 
its launch was a day of mourning, celebration, and reflection. The horror of the act we had committed weighted heavily upon us all, the necessity of our crime did little to comfort us. The gift had barely cleared the outer cometary halo when the mistake was realized, but it was too late. The gift could not be caught, could not be recalled or diverted from its path. The architects and work crews, horrified at the awful power of the thing upon which they labored, had quietly self-terminated in droves, walking unshielded into radiation zones. Neglecting proper null pressure safety or simple ceasing their nutrient consumption until their metabolic functions stopped. The appalling cost in lives had forced the orchestrators to streamline the gift's design and construction. There had been no time for the design or implementation of anything beyond the simple, massive engines and the stabilizing systems. We could only watch in shame and horror as the light of genocide faded into infrared against the distant void. They grew, and they changed, in a handful of lifetimes they abolished war, abandoned their violent tendencies and turned themselves to the grand purposes of life and art. We watched them remake first themselves, and then their world. Their frail, soft bodies gave way to gleaming metals and plastics, they unified their people through an omnipresent communications grid and produced art of such power and emotion, the likes of which the galaxy has never seen before. Or again, because of us. They converted their home world into a paradise, by their standards, and many 10 carat 6s of them poured out into the surrounding system with a rapidity and vigor that we could only envy. With bodies built to survive every environment from the daylit surface of their innermost world, to the atmosphere of their largest gas giant and the cold void in between, they set out to sculpt their system into something beautiful. At first we thought them simple miners, stripping the rocky planets and moons for vital resources, but then we began to see the purpose to their constructions, the artworks carved into every surface, and traced across the system in glittering lights and dancing fusion trails. And still, our terrible gift approached. They had less than two squared dealy to see it, following so closely on the tail of its own light. In that time, oh so brief even by their fleeting lives, more than ten to the power of tenth sentients prepared for death. Lovers exchanged last words, separated by worlds and the tyranny of light speed. Their planet-side engineers worked frantically to build sufficient transmission infrastructure to upload the countless masses with the necessary neural modifications, while those above dumped lifetimes of music and literature from their databanks to make room for passengers. Those lacking the required hardware or the time to acquire it consigned themselves to death, lashed out in fear and pain, or simply went about their lives as best they could under the circumstances. The gift arrived suddenly, the light of its impact visible in our skies, shining bright and cruel even to the unaugmented ocular receptor. We watched and we wept for our victims, dead so many dealers before the light of their doom had even reached us. Many 6 carat 4s of those who had been directly or even tangentially involved in the creation of the gift sealed their spiracles with paste as a final penance for the small roles they had played in this atrocity. The light dimmed, the dust cleared, and our observatories refocused upon the place where their shining blue world had once hung in the void, and found only dust and the pale gleam of an orphaned moon, wrapped in a thin, burning wisp of atmosphere that had once belonged to its parent. Radiation and relativistic shrapnel had wiped out much of the inner system, and continent-sized chunks of molten rock carried screaming ghosts outward at interstellar escape velocities, damned to wander the great void for an eternity. The damage was apocalyptic, but not complete, from the shadows of the outer worlds, tiny points of light emerged, thousands of fusion trails of single ships and world ships and everything in between, many 10 carat 6s of survivors in flesh and steel and memory banks, ready to rebuild. For a few moments we felt relief, even joy, and we were filled with the hope that their culture and art would survive the terrible blow we had dealt them. Then came the message, tightly focused at our star, transmitted simultaneously by hundreds of their ships. We know you are out there, and we are coming for you. I'm Sage Ends. I am Death, the Hand of the Gods and the Shepherd of the Forsaken. I am called the Dark Mistress, Black Veiled, and She Who Walks. I talk to neither the divines above nor the humans in their earthly kingdoms. But, his people called me by the name Morta. Emotions are not felt by us gods, the way it is felt by the mortals, especially not in the way it is felt by humans. Their hearts are more pure, but they are more vulnerable to the sway of the winds. And such, I have never felt for anyone, god or not, what I felt for the sun sold. 
His hair like fine spun gold was greater than Apollo's rays. Honey words flowed from his mouth sweeter than Mercury's. His word was honor and his arm stronger than even our father Jupiter. He was fierce in a way that Mars wasn't and wise like great Minerva. Man was never meant to be more than any other race, be it the satyr, nymphs, or even gods. However, greatness was forged in his very bones. The sky was grey and winds fierce on the day he was brought to this world and yet his soul shined like the sun. Of all the beautiful souls of the humans, his was gold and bright like no other. There are always humans who prove stronger than Mars or cleverer than grey-eyed Minerva, but something in him was more. I readied myself for the death that I knew would come upon the child. The gods are jealous for good reason. With spirits as strong as humans do, they can never be allowed to have such great abilities. Father Jupiter has told many of the greatest heroes whose strength has become the better of them. I stood outside the small cottage for days ready for the small, gold spirit to leave his body and lead him below, but alas, the boy lived through his first week. I returned to our cave with sisters, but I never truly left the boy. Age did not make dull the gold of man's hair and his body was perfection amongst men. His mother named him Elias, after the sun, and I have never heard a more befitting name. My duties are to come before any worldly endeavor. The gods are not forbidden to lay with man, but I'm no mere god. I am death. But, I could never help but feel pulled towards the man. When his mother died, he was no more than fifteen years of age. Tears fell from his eyes the color of the sea. He held his tiny sister close to his chest and consoled his father. Prayers issued from his mouth like liquid love. To Jupiter and Pluto his wished his mother safe passage and peace in Elysium. For once in my very long life, I did not want to take a soul from this world. The boy found solace in the fields. He was not a mere farmer. He could never be. He was the son given human form. So, not, a single person was confused when the boy was asked by Sylvanus to join him on his council as a court poet. The boy sang like any human, beautiful, and longing. The fawns loved the boy as greatly as anyone could, for he rooted himself in their hearts as he did with anyone who has met him. Songs were created for every fawn who died and every fawn bomb. I visited the boy at every death and every time I heard him sing my cold, unbeating heart cracked for him. That a one man should ever feel so much sorrow is unheard of. No more than a year had passed and all of Rome heard of the golden boy who sang of the dead. The world knew of his songs that took a bit of his son-like soul every time. With every time the name Elias escaped from strangers' lips, a heat of two kinds overtook my being. Affection was always anchored in my heart for the boy, but a feeling I can only describe as jealously also warmed me, in its uncomfortable way. On his twentieth birthday, the boy was given leave by Sylvanus to travel the world and sing his music of death. Elias, the Golden, was received by everyone with doubt, for who could sing as grand as the stories say. But, he always left amongst tears of joy and sadness. All who met him learned what he truly was. He was a human boy. The best that the gods could find and it was human. Yet, the gods never ordered me to take his life. I never stopped fearing that they would, as he always found ways to come closer and closer to me. On his travels, the boy was still naive, having spent so much time in the hedonistic fawn's wood. He found a man on the roadside, sitting amongst weeds and stone. I watched, feeling the death coming, as the boy stopped his horse and reached his hand out to the man. It was watching the blade enter his stomach that made me feel as though blade had entered mine. The man rode off with Elias' horse and the boy lay on the road dying. I had stayed by his side for hours as I watched his golden soul struggle to hold on. In his feverish state, with blood pouring from his body, the boy spoke to me for the first time. Please, dark mistress take me from this place, he looked skyward with clouded eyes. I would take you with me, sweet, golden one, I said as I kneeled beside him, and he started looking upon my face. But, it is neither my place to stave off or hasten death, I am only here to take you in time. The boy shook his head and looked back toward the sky. 
As the clouds broke, a beam of light spotted itself onto Elias, in front of me and only him. I watched with my own eyes, as his wound sealed and soul returned to its former luster. I'm sorry, mistress, he smiled, look in the direction he remembered me. From that day on, I had watched as the boy turned man, on his travel home. He walked, sailed, and rode for years. Snake-haired crones, one-eyed giants, and red-haired maidens all tried to take the golden one from this world. But, it was his combination of everything that made him perfectly human that kept my hands from him. It was his sweet songs of the dead that turned the gorgons. For they have too much want for such melancholic arts. His son-like soul would not let him take their lives, so he continued to sing for them until they gave him leave. Not long past a year, they gave him his life back with embraces and found touches. He sang no greater than any nymph could, but his beautiful human soul, that felt too much made the Gorgons love him. The Cyclopes who would not listen to reason, found that the man could meet violence with violence. With spear in hand and the love of the gods ended the life of the two giants. He left his spear in the eye of one, the other was drowned in the neighboring lake. It was not the way he killed the Cyclops that caused the entirety of heaven to weep, but the song he constructed to memorize those who he could give peace in Elysium. He fought with his human strength, that lacked what the Cyclops had, but he had all the courage and determination of a human warrior. When a tribe of Trivia's own Empusei found the golden-haired man, I held my cold breath. They took the man, with their beautiful hands and marched him to their cave, in Pluto's realm on bronzen legs. Their fiery hair shined as they took their turns with him and yet, he cried under them all. Again, his spirit waned as his hold on this world lessened, and the pull from under increased. Still, he sang songs of those whose souls bided outside filled the cave. Spirits flooded the entrance and even the earth groaned as it tried to find the beautiful man. It was the Lord of the Dead, Pluto, who gave Elias respite. The shadow came to the man personally, an honor given to few mortal men. All but Elias recoiled as the tall pale figure, entered the cave, even I felt I could not be close to my master. He stooped before the man and held out his hand. I watched in awe, as again, his spirit restored itself back to its splendor. Pluto took Elias by man and escorted him to the surface of the world. A gift given to only two mortals in all the world both who were the lowly humans. Elias, the golden-haired, the sun-souled, favored by the gods, was brought home, after ten years of travel. He discovered upon his arrival that his father had died. I wept with him, as his sister held him the way I wish I could, but a god was never supposed to, for he was only human. He again prayed to the gods for his father and sang his melodies as he plucked flowers for the grave of his father. It took no time for maidens to come across the world to ask for his hand. With his honey words, he turned down all of them. He felt nothing for the girls and I began to understand his weeping in the cave of the Empusei. It wasn't until the maiden Lulia, daughter of Jupiter himself, came for him, with her soul that was not gold like his, but a shining pink. She did not deserve him, even if she was human. With eyes like the sky and hips like the sea, she caught his attention, but it was the way she spoke to his dear sister that gave him his affections. It was with an emotion stronger than jealousy that I watched their wedding. He loved and sang. It was what he was made for. The gods could make many creatures, many races, yet the human heart evaded them. It was too vulnerable, too sweet. I wanted him as my own, and seeing him amongst the other humans who could give him what he needed made me weep. Why could I not have been human too? With a heavy heart, I watched as Elias sang for his Lilia's funeral. She too found her way into my heart after I watched her love the boy with the gold hair, the way I wish I could. His hair was now silk white, and back bowed, but he was no less magnificent. He was still remarkably human and swayed the gods with his words. When he did finally die, I regretted every time I had hoped he would. To see the gold of his soul fade and rise was the worst moment of my very long life. He greeted me with his large, beautiful smile and his twinkled like the sea. Is it finally time? He asked. 
I only nodded as I tried to hide any grief on my face. I brought him to stand before the gods as they decided his fate. They stood, gloriously, around the hall of the gods, with Elias in their center. He knelt humbly before them and did not speak once to them, similarly to the other humans who have come here before, but not like the nymphs or even fauns. When the gods offered him godhood he respectfully declined. Though, he smiled just at the offer. Who would I be to sing so much of death, if I were to never meet my sweet mistress? He said as he remained knelt. Ah, spoke Jupiter, with shining bolt in hand, you have, though. She stand no more than a foot behind you. He turned and smiled a knowing expression. We have met before, I could never forget him, and hopefully, neither he, I. In all respect, Father Jupiter, bowed his head, I am only man, I must die. Our Father Jupiter looked on in deep thought for many moments and finally spoke. We only wish to not see your spirit fade from this world, dear Elias, but if you wish to die, then we will let you. Jupiter nodded to me and I performed my task. I led Elias to Elysium. It was my last role as death for I could never stand to see another man die. I presented the man to his wife and I cried as they embraced. Spirits from across the entirety of Pluto's domain flocked to the golden-spirited Elias. He smiled his glorious smile and his golden hair again shone. The gold sold song, but this time of life, and all of the spirits sang with him. I am no longer death, but I am not dead. I wish many times, that I could stay with him, sweet Elias, with the human dead. I fear, though, that I do not feel like them. My emotions are not pure enough and do not sway in the wind. It was only his humanity that turned me, not his beauty or his strength, although he was not wont for them. A human had turned death, when not even a god could. What game are you playing, my child? The Stellarin asked as he walked to the boy playing in the outdoor sun. Despite his great age, several centuries by human reckoning, suns and moons curse that race his lithe form echoed that of his youthful son, an elegant economy of motion evident in every motion. I'm playing war, father. The boy said with unbridled enthusiasm, wielding his toy sword with an agile grace that the greatest human acrobats would envy. One day, when I am old enough, I shall join the League of Warriors and make war against the foul humans as you did, father. And this time, we shall push them out from the rim worlds once and for all. At his son's words, the elder Stellarin felt his knees give way underneath him, and a lump catch in his throat as terror's icy hands gripped his heart. Father. The younger asked, seeing his father stagger, what's wrong? Shall I call the dash? Sit down, my son. Would you like me to tell you a story about my days fighting the humans, all those long centuries ago? Before I met your mother, before I had you. A true story, unlike the ones the Grand Council tell. But, but father, the, the Council tells of great victories, of valiant actions by our warriors, and great strikes against humans. There lies, my dear son, the elder said flatly. Ignoring the look of disbelief on his son's face, he continued, lies that I too, once believed. The council tells us that the humans started the war, that their race wished to complete what they started when they drove us, the Dwarven and the Uruk off the home world, and they did so by attacking Vulsan, Gilea, and Terry Neal. The Council tells of valiant last stands, heroic actions, and a final assault against the rampaging humans that drove them off our worlds, did they not? I told you, my child, they are lies. In truth, we began the war. Vulsan, Gilea, and Terry Neal were the worlds where we gathered our troops. I, myself, was born on Temi Neal. You should have seen us, my child, 20,000 of our world's finest, standing arrayed with gleaming armor, protected by the finest force fields, armed with lancer blade and fission bows. We knew that we would later be joined by 50,000 more warriors from Vilsan and Gilea's leagues. Our first, and only target, was the human world of Lee's world. We mocked the name, 
mocked the human's lack of creativity, and we thought it a simple enough matter to throw them off the world and claim it for our own. We had superior technology, and no race travels faster in space, in the sky, or on the ground than we. We landed and struck suddenly, taking the token garrison entirely by surprise, it was a sparsely settled world, and after a week, we had thought the world pacified. We were wrong. The human assault came soon after those two months. A massive fleet, yet a fraction of their entire imperial forces, soon emerged into space above us, and immediately began landing troops. My child, have you seen a human drop army deploying? Ship after ship dropping soldiers on rocket packs, raining armies from above. For so long, our masters have had the techno sorcery of teleportation. We simply didn't consider humans, with their absolute lack of magic, would resort to such methods to deploy their armies, and while our masters and captains teleported to wherever they were needed most, there were simply too many humans in too many places to fight. Oh yes, that's right, my child, too many humans. Not even 70,000 warriors could fight them. It sounds unbelievable only to those who have never faced a human army. Tell me, how many soldiers do you think they dropped? No, not 100,000 200,000. No, my child, guess again, we would have defeated them even if they had landed that many. My child, enough guessing, I'll tell you, they landed over 6 million soldiers on Lee's world that day. How do I know? Let me finish the story. Our army was destroyed the day they landed. Warriors, who I had trained alongside, and fought side by side for more than a hundred years, were cut down in a storm of war. The human lasers were so numerous, I saw many of our soldiers obliterated in what seemed to my eyes a wall of light. A single laser would have caused our shields to merely flicker, but a hundred would demolish both it and its wearer. Human artillery never stopped thundering, and for each human we killed, it seemed like a hundred would take his place. We Stellarin are trained to face enemies in single combat, each of us, but not even the greatest avatar of war can defend all sides at once. The humans don't understand our concept of honorable combat, seeing one-on-one -on -one battles between equals as foolish, instead, they struck at our supply lines, poisoned our food and drink, broadcast loud propaganda at night to disrupt our rest. Let loose vermin that carried plagues their bodies could withstand and we could not, and when all that was done, take pot shots from afar at us with snipers and drones. Only when we were truly weakened did their assaults come. We did not force the humans off our worlds, my son, they forced us off theirs. They proceeded to bomb, then raise Vilsan, Gilia, and Terry Neal while they ignored our entreaties for peace. They burned the world trees of each world, rendering each world magicless for centuries to come. The valiant struggles by our warriors to chase them off. They were almost all failures, our only victories came from attacks on isolated supply stations and minor supply line raids, victories that the council milked for all they were worth. In the end, only after their appetite for vengeance was settled did the humans leave, bought off yes, bought of by the council with techno sorcerer secrets and slaves. Don't believe me? I was held imprisoned after the assault, one of only a few hundred of our forces sent to war. I met your mother in that prison, you know. A galleon, she outranked me, but in there, we were all equals. You and she are the only good things that came from that war, and I thanks the stars and moons every day that I was so blessed. We were released, and walked through the holds of the human transports, so that we could see who we made war with, and the cost of doing so, and thus bring the news back to our worlds. I saw holds brimming with stellar and treasures, troop transports each carrying more soldiers than the forces we sent to Lee's world. You know how those who boast tend to exaggerate their accomplishments? Our warden, the commander of the human forces, was telling us about the troops he brought, and the number I arrived at 6 million, was one I came up with after I downgraded his own words, I refuse to believe that even among the humans. 
they could somehow come up with more than 20 million soldiers to bring to a single world. But in any case, my son, dear heart, set your sight on other things beside the humans. Wage war against the Uruk, or the Dwarfin, or the cursed Ilfidim, or the warrior breeds of the Chkin hives, for those wars, those we might win. Anything, than those accursed humans. As the hyperdrive carried them along the star road, as hyperspace lanes were called, the two green-skinned Uruk sat playing cards with their dwarf and co-owner. They were the only crew on the ship. Primarily because the finely crafted dwarf and ship needed no more crew, and also because any more Uruk would have meant that sooner or later, there'd have been a fight. You know, that world, woe's name, Elysia, it was one of our worlds once, for De Humius took it. Grok, shut up and deal de cards. Oi am just saying, yan I'll what, can't a irk say something why out your jumping on his back. Shut it and deal, your pansy sprout. Oil show yet. Oil that's right enough I've had oh your two squab blin. The dwarfin said. Now, Grok, are ye going ta deal? Or are ye and Uga gonna start whacking each other over the heads again with those clubs oh yours? Sorry boss. Honestly, ye yeah too. Want to know why the humans managed to take your world? It's cause of your inability ta discuss anything wi out get in someone killed. Ye yeah, see the humans doing that. Nail they fight and bicker amongst themselves ta be sure, but at least they know how to pull tajur when th go in s tough. Big words, little boss, Uga laughed maliciously. After all, it's not like the Humius took anything oh your peoples, oh wait. Go ahead, laugh it up ye tool at least when ye buy something dwarfin, you're sure of buying something made well, and no made well enough. Those crazy tall jobs didn't even wait till something's legal, before spreading it. That didn't stop the Humius making more money than you lot. How many dwarf and old what at T shut down lately? Do you want to keep working for me or not? The great hive was a buzz, to use a human pun, Queen Mother 49 observed. She was the oldest and wisest of the Queen Mothers, and her station demanded that the strongest of her warrior children brought her to the great hive. Queen Mother 135 had brought a motion to the hive, and while Queen Mother 49 wasn't told of what it was, as per ancient tradition, she had a pretty good idea of what 135 wanted. She didn't know that 135's request was made in the same spirit as a Stellaran child on the other edge of the galaxy, or that she felt the same way as the child's father, but it would not have mattered if she did. News from our trader spawn hath revealed that humanity's greatest strengths are their numbers. 135 screeched in ritual high speech. The other races are hard pressed, for though they have superior technology or strength, they simply number fewer, or cannot outproduce the primates. But Queen Mother 49, surely thou can see that their numbers are but a drop in what we can do. I, in concert with my lesser queens, can birth two score times a thousand warriors in the time it takes the humans to birth and train a tenth of that number. I alone could raise an army to take 10 human food worlds for our race, think of what we could all do in concert. A screeching hail of consent greeted 135's words, even the older queens colored the blue of consideration, a color only Queen Mother 49 could see, in fact, she was the only member of her race outside the mindless worker castes to see in color. It was this ability that gave her her position that had ensured her rise over the centuries over other queen's mother, a near mythical ability to see the lies and feelings that her other kin could not. Nobody knew where she'd received the gift, nobody outside a select few individuals knew she even had the power, but Alchkin agreed that she wasn't brawn with it. In her youth, Queen Mother 49 had ventured beyond the stars with her brood, determined to carve a name out for herself. She returned decades later with her brood mostly intact, but the Queen Mother herself had changed. Ever since then, she had led her race, with all those who would challenge her rule outmaneuvered both in the political arena and in some cases, on the battlefield. And now it was time for her to pay her debt and save her people. 
wouldst thou listen to me, 135, of why I think thy idea is, to couch it in the politest of terms, sheer folly? Queen Mother 49 asked gently. She saw 135's carapace color the green of fury, 135 was proud, too proud, perhaps. But her words were respectful. Forgive me, Queen Mother, if my words didst unnerve thee. I wouldst be willing to hear thine words on why we should not assault the primates. Queen Mother 49 turned the red of satisfaction as she asked a question. Tell me, 135, wouldst thou accept a human as a chicken? Or a dwarfin? Or a stellarin? Mayhap en an illborn ill-eatim? What? No, great mother, of course not. Wouldst I did so, thou tea most welcome to think me mad. 135 said, her green carapace now spotted with purple and black. The humans would. The humans have, Queen Mother 49 said calmly. Their soldiers may use basic weapons equal to anything our shaper cast can spawn, but their super weapons, elite troops and greater war machines are designed and created not by their kin, but dwarf and mavericks, unaccepted by their own kin, accepted by the humans. Uruk warriors, hungering not for bloodshed, but the camaraderie of fellow warriors, serve alongside Ithidim warrior sorcerer auxiliaries in human armies, and both often reach high command. Stellarin can be found navigating their most important ships, either because they cannot take the structure of Stellarin society, or because they have found human mates. Impossible. Disgusting. But true, Queen Mother 91. The other races doth speak of the humans' blatant speciesism, but tis reality. Humans accept far more of other races than we, theirs. Fight any one race if each of us were alone, but can we outmaneuver Stellarin navigators? Can our sorcery compete with Lithidium mastery of the ninefold path? Hath our warriors suddenly evolved carapaces that can withstand Uruk's strength, or our hives withstand Dwarfin weapons? For if we wage war on humans, all this we shall surely face, for they are willing to see those en not of their kind as equals, not paid help or mercenaries. Queen Mother 49, that is a risk we must take. 135 said hotly. The farmland on our worlds doth run fallow with o arrows, the rivers run dry. We must take the human's worlds, or we shall all starvel. If Queen Mother 49 could sigh with exasperation, she would. Instead, she just turned a bright pink with black spots. The situation wasn't half as bad as 135 said, their worlds were more than capable of sustaining them. What she didn't have was that feeling of glory in her carapace, that fire burning within her fluids that told her she was worth something. What 135 had, in fact, was the same desire that Queen Mother 49 had when she was young, and her memories drifted back. She broke off. She had to focus on the here and now. I have considered this question, Queen Mother 135, and though to displease thee, tis but the sole island of sanity in the ocean of madness that would descend on us ere we go to war. Queen Mother 49 knew it was not all that intelligent to insult 135. Especially with the young queen practically frothing at the mouth, but to hell with that. Bitch. And what plan is this, Queen Mother 49? 135 asked, the hostility of her bright green carapace coloring her voice slightly now. She was speaking low speech now, too agitated to bother with high speech, and uncaring of the political fallout, more evidence of her youth, Queen Mother 49, realized, mentally taking back her bitch remark. We have them help us. Queen Mother 49 said simply. With human technology aiding them, our workers can harvest food far better than we could ever before. And how are we to do that, Queen Mother 49? 135 asked. If not through conquest? For the only other way would be to, to join their alliance. There was silence, and the hive burst into an uproar. Even so, 
Queen Mother 49 observed with red satisfaction that there were many blues in the chamber. Several hours later, Queen Mother 49 was acreed out of the hive, having successfully argued for a trial membership, with both sides, chicken and human, exchanging limited resources for a while, the mutual relationship providing for a closer relationship should the need arise. As her warriors carried her to her biopship, she allowed herself to reminisce, of leading her armies off into space, wanting to carve out her own empire. Of meeting a human trading fleet, and being awed by both the sheer power of the fleet, and the diversity of the crew. Of trading food, resources, and most importantly, bio-engineered compound eyes instead of weapons fire. She lifted one of her clawed arms, the talons at its end currently retracted. Of one human, James, helping her adapt to the new, terrifying world of color of James, the skilled, but poor doctor, giving of his skills generously, without fear or favor. The claw came out, and Queen Mother 49 allowed herself to be lost in the memories the simple gold ring brought back. Here's my most outstanding one. Be me at age 19. Me and a few friends, my cuz Steve and my buddies Andrew and Greg, decide to travel for the summer. I made a bunch of money in stocks and crap overnight a month before so I'm kinda willing to dish out money for traveling. We decide to go to Chernobyl. Stupidest mistake of our lives. It was a damn nightmare getting there, Ukraine is a crap hole for those here who don't already know. Basically we got there and got in and it was pretty much just empty ruins and stuff. We brought shotguns and I brought a 44 so we wouldn't get raped or robbed. Three's nights and freaky stuff starts happening. Greg swears on his life he sees someone in an apartment window and he gets really sleeved out. Greg's bigger than all of us but he can be a massive pussy sometimes. I tell him that if anyone messes with us out here, no one will ever find their body. We all convince him and each other that it was nothing. The next day we go walking around some parks and buildings. Everything's rusted, there was a headless doll left in the middle of the road. The buildings are really sketchy and unsafe, but we go in them anyway. Me Andrew and Steve are all white nationalists so we start commenting on this communist's mural painted in the hall. Greg's a wigger and he doesn't care about the convo and starts upstairs. He's up there for like 20 seconds before he jumps down from the top and breaks it out the door going holy crap holy crap run run damn. We all bolt out of the building after him shouting for him to tell us what the hell he's on about. He's outside holding his gun towards the door. We all run to him and he's clearly not screwing around by the look on him. I'm just silent as Andrew and Steve start asking him why he just did that. I draw my gun and watch around us, constantly looking at the door. Greg starts saying in the most serious voice I've ever heard from him that he saw a man up there with an iron rod. I immediately suggest that we go in and confront him. Greg's like no dude he wasn't human it's messed up. Andrew agrees with me and we get Steve to come. Greg doesn't want to be alone so he has to come. Greg and Steve stay downstairs while me and Andrew go up. Everyone knows to check their targets but I'm really worried Greg will shoot one of us so I tell him to be careful what he shoots before I we go up. He's not in good shape and he's a pussy but not this much of a pussy so I realize this is pretty serious. We go through the rooms upstairs checking corners and shit. Eventually we find a dead wolf. The stench is freaking horrid, it's clearly routed. The thing's been mutilated and its head has been pulled out of its neck. There's blood everywhere, and it's clear that this animal was being eaten at it, which is freaking odd cause it's pushed up and rotten. I start getting all weak, which happens when I think about anatomy. The wall in this room has collapsed and someone could easily climb the rubble down to the street so we know that if anything was up here it's gone. We go downstairs and tell Steve and Greg what we found. After everyone goes back up to look at the wolf we head outside and look for shelter. We wander around alert as hell looking for somewhere to spend the night. Eventually we see this garage thing with a usable windowless door. It's totally empty except for a crappy old chair. We set up our stuff for the night and start planning what to do. We set up a two-man watch team and go to bed while there's still light. Me and Andrew are on watch and we start talking about random crap. Suddenly I have to poop Max. We've been eating baked beans and jerky the whole week so I know I can't poop Max inside or it'll stink up the place. 
Me and Andrew go outside and I poop Max next to the door while he stands watch. I'm about finished when he calmly tells me to hurry the hell up before it comes over here. I say, dude what the hell don't be an asshole right now and he goes, there's a guy standing out there watching us I'm not screwing around. I finish up and Lou and sure enough there's a guy out there, but there's also a second guy standing too. We go in and keep on watching. Eventually our watch is up so we wake up the others and tell them about how two demons watched me poop Max outside. I go to bed wondering how I'll wake up. In the morning we eat our food and check the guns and equipment, Geiger counters in a bong. We go out the garage door rather than the side door. Greg and Steve tells us that after we went to sleep there was scuffing noises near the side door, so we go around to check. My crap is gone. I'm revolted as hell so is everyone else. The demon ate my crap literally. We head back up the road, planning to get the hell out of Chernobyl. After two hours of walking we notice something trailing us a long way away. It's walking behind us in the woods, no shirt but weird messed up pants. If we had a rifle I would have gunned it down right there. We just keep walking, checking on it ever now and then. It gets cloister every 45 minutes or so, and we're getting tired. Every time we break for a rest, it just stands there watching. As it starts getting late, we look for shelter again, this time we find an old building that kind of resembled a gas station. We go in, lock up the door, and use the same watch system as the night before. This building has windows though, and we can see them standing outside watching, closer than they stood to the garage last night. In the morning we head out and they're gone again. An hour into our trek we catch sight of our follower. It's not walking though. About a mile behind us, it starts a squaddle sprinting towards where we are, jerking around and letting out this faint wail. I'm scared for about half a second, but then I remember my skin color and it fades instantly. We stand and wait, guns ready. During the time it takes for the demon to close the distance, we all conclude that this is some kind of trap, or that the creatures are testing us. We decide to advance towards the thing. We walk forward in a horizontal line, guns forward, ready to mess this thing up. I never thought it would actually come within range, I figured it would ever off to the side or stop at some point, but when it gave us the chance, I didn't hesitate a moment. We fired in unison, and let me tell you it was past overkill. The creature lost an entire arm, and its chest was a mangled mess. Before we fired me Steve and Andrew all screamed hail victory, which seems a little gay now, but at the time I felt like the biggest badass this world has ever seen. After we finished it we just stood there looking at its corpse. Its skin was pale, with a yellow-green tinge, and its insides were black and reeked of rot. We stood there looking, and Greg just says, that was freak intense. I start laughing and I'm like yeah and we all turn around to start walking again but we stop dead. Everywhere in front of us, and as far as I could see down the road, they stood there watching. It was like time froze. We started running away backwards, and they just stood there watching. After we ran so far that we couldn't see them anymore, we slowed down and started freaking out because now we couldn't take the road out, they had reaped us we argued for a while until Steve said he heard a car. There was nowhere to hide, so we just stood next to the road, guns hidden, and we waited. The car turned out to be Ukrainian law enforcement when had heard the shots and we're coming to investigate. Apparently we had been just a short while away from the last checkpoint into Chernobyl. One of the officers looked dead into my eyes and says in Russian, any trouble? I can tell he knew we were in trouble, and I could tell that he knew exactly what kind of trouble. We asked them for a ride back, and they kindly obliged. As we passed the spot where we shot the creature, there was no sign of any body, or even black blood. It's worth mentioning that these officers are strapped with axe and even grenades. I'm like quietly poop maxing myself because I realized that these guys hadn't picked us up, we wouldn't have made it. They drove us all the way to the first checkpoint, not stopping once. When they dropped us off, the same officer from before looked at me with that same look as before and said, they never used to kill you no, he says they used to be scared. Then he and his buddy just drive off. It's not really a nope, but it freaked me the hell out. That was three years ago, and if those things ever get bold enough I wouldn't be surprised if we heard about something like riots in Ukraine in a decade or two. Seriously though, don't go to Chernobyl.